talk. Talk. Talk to me Tuesday. Hey there, welcome to Talk To Me Tuesday on a Tuesday. I'm your host, Madi B, and today we have a very, very special show. We're gonna really educate a lot about traumatic brain injury. Now, normally during a non-pandemic environment, we would have our normal annual ride for TBI. This is where we come together as a community, especially to our motorcycle community and recognize those members that have suffered from a traumatic brain injury and those who didn't survive. We are sad to say that this year, due to COVID, this event has been canceled. However, our community safely, safety is extremely important to us, and this was the right decision due to the time. In honor of our Traumatic Brain Injury Week, we have a special guest that specializes in with injuries to the brain. We want to highlight the seriousness and of this injury, and if you guys have any questions, this is where we want to open up those lines of communication. I would like to welcome Dr. Hamza, a medical forensic neuropsychologist and the director of the Neurobehavioral Clinic. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this program. Appreciate it. Absolutely. It was it's such a pleasure to have you and you know to have such an expert on the program. I think it's going to be super important for our viewers to really learn um, a lot about traumatic brain injury. So let's go ahead and get started with telling us a little bit about yourself and the impact that you've already done in the world so far. For sure, for sure. Um, it's hard talking about yourself, huh? But <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, uh, I started actually as a computer scientist and a mathematician, and um, it was very interesting how I ended up in, how I ended up in this field. Um, I was supposed to take in, in my graduate program uh, in computing sciences, uh, course in cognitive science. Um, I took my cousin with me. I said, let's go see what this course is all about. And at the time, it was, um, you know, in the 90s, we were developing a uh, artificial intelligence program. And they said, you really need to take a course in cognitive science, not all in engineering and computing, uh, computer science uh, and so on. I said, okay. Uh, my cousin went to sleep. He, uh, he was <laughs> Uh, aeronautical engineering major at the time, and I just fell in love. So I started majoring in both uh, the field of cognitive science and uh, computing sciences, and I saw an incredible um, interaction between the two. Um, those were the times where Steve Jobs um, and um, Bill Gates and all the other starts coming out, but I was uh, fascinated by what science can do and how you can um, um, integrate the both. Um, and some of the theories that got my attention were the connectionist theory, the information processing theory, which, um, you know, relies a lot on computing sciences. I have not had uh, the slightest thought at the time that I would mix all of this and it will lead me to where I am um, uh, in, you know, into uh, those days. So I majored in those fields. Um, so I am a uh, computer scientist. I'm also a cognitive scientist in the field of cognitive psychology. Then I got more interested in the clinical part of it. And, um, you know, I became a clinical psychologist licensed in this state. And um, because of my interest in the brain science, um, uh, my post PhDs and doctorate levels were in neuropsychology and brain science, um, uh, forensic psychology, and then more. Um, uh, uh, as you cover all those areas, then you, you know the interest starts covering the medical arena. So uh, I went to what we call the medical school for uh, clinical psychologists, and I received my um, uh, work in uh, three-year rigorous uh, year training in psychopharmacology and medical psychology, um, completed that as well. Um, uh, currently, I hold a, uh, the post of uh, research fellow and a full tenured uh, professor 
um, uh, you know, uh, in the field of uh, clinical mental health. Uh, also, I, I, um, I am the director of the Neurobehavioral Clinic. Uh, we started over a decade ago, and uh, my work covers all aspects from um, mental disorders um, to neurocognitive disorders known to people such as dementia, uh, you know, Alzheimer's, uh, bipolar, you name it. Um, my area of expertise covers in the medical, but also in the forensic. And by forensic, we mean here legal. So we have the personal injury, for example. We have uh, criminal uh, law that we are into as well. So I've worked on a uh, number of large uh, criminal cases. Um, and I do work, uh, you know, in both sides. Uh, personal injuries is also one of the areas that I have been working on. Um, I, I think uh, the total number, uh, I'm not sure, but close to 300 cases in all, you know, both areas. And also I, due to being a, uh, you know, uh, research uh, fellow, you know, which is the highest um, rank that you can uh, earn and bestowed on, you know, at the university level, as a full professor, I, uh, you know, I publish in the field, so I have to do a lot of research. And my latest research has been um, on PTSD and HDS, which is a human devastation syndrome, um, a, a term that I coined in 2016 and received a lot of uh, international, uh, um, I guess, attention. Wow, so that's, that's, that's a lot chill. of credentials. That's a lot more than, you know, probably we were expecting. And we want to dive a little bit deeper on a lot of those things that you kind of mentioned. Um, we want to start uncovering exactly the definition process and then going into some of these effects that it may have. Um, I know you do have huge titles, doctor. Um, I know the one that I introduced you with was forensic neuropsychologist and also a director of neurobehavioral clinic. So I want you to explain for our viewers, what exactly does that mean? Right. Um, like I said, you know, in the beginning, it's, it's uh, you know, I started in the science and, you know, computing sciences and engineering. Then we jumped in into cognitive science, then into, uh, you know, uh, the brain science and then into the forensics, then back into the medical. So if I put all of those together as a salad, that's what you get. Uh, medical because uh, of the field of psychopharmacology. Uh, so um, everything is based on training and education. So I'm a psychopharmacologist, meaning medications. That's simply what it is. Mm -hmm. So in all the cases, we uh, review the medications. We look at uh, what could have been the cause. Is this working? Is this not working? It's just simply the science of psychopharmacology from a medical point of view. So I'm going to dissect it. Uh, uh, forensic, meaning the legal, um, criminal or civil. You know, those are the cases that we uh, look at. And I've done cases at the state and the federal level. So that's, uh, you know, part of it. Uh, and then neuropsych. So neuropsych, as you see, it has two parts to it. If we just say a psych, that means only psychological. Um, uh, what people know about psychological, you know, depression, bipolar, and all that. Neuro part of it is that we have to be uh, highly trained in the area of a brain science, which you get it from the psychopharmacology, you get it in the forensics as well, and you get it in the psych but more in depth into how does uh, the brain behavior connect. Mm -hmm. So let me make it very easy here. A lot of times when we get a case, we need to find out, is it the chicken or is it the egg? Is it the psychological issues that is creating neurological issues? Or is it the narrow, the organic, the brain, right? That machine is creating the psychological issues. My job is to figure out which one is which. So we do a comprehensive testing, assessments, and diagnoses to find out what is the cause. So do we have a real dementia, for example, which is neurocognitive impairment, or do we have a pseudo-dementia? Pseudo-dementia meaning it feels like it, it tastes like it, but it's not really dementia. And we find out that the cause is maybe emotional uh, disturbance, could be severe depression, some psychiatric um, you know, 
condition that have caused um, uh, the memory losses or the memory disturbances or whatever. So we, we look at the, the whole picture from both. So uh, when we go to court, uh, as you know, we are on the grill <laughs> by the yeah. attorneys uh, to uh, try to figure out. So in, in a nutshell, if I am to combine all of this, it boils down in almost in every case to the neuroscience of the case. That's what boils down to it. In almost in every case that I've been on is the neuroscience of it. And it's a deep, deep ocean. Yeah. And I agree with you. All of this is, it's going to be deep in regards to, I mean, we're talking about the brain here and you know, what, what can happen, these injuries, what it can do. This may be a show that we have a part two doctor, because I know I don't, I want to uncover a lot of this stuff. Um, and that way we can go a little bit more deeper the next show. However, today we are talking about traumatic brain injury. Okay. I know Correct. you have a lot of um, background on the neuro side. Now I do want you to kind of explain to our viewers um, the exact meaning of traumatic brain injury. Okay, L let's take a look first at the, um, you know, at the definition by the Brain Injury Association of America, BIAA, mm -hmm. where it says TBI is defined as an alteration in brain function or other evidence of brain pathology, illness, sickness, whatever you want to call it, caused by an external force, that something must have happened to alter the brain functioning, okay, and so on. Of course, I find this to be a very, very simple, you know, uh, traumatic brain injury definition because there are many packages that comes along with a traumatic brain injury and then how it happens and what happens and so on. So for example, if I may give, I don't know, you know, regarding Absolutely. time and so on. So can a uh, brain injury happens in a moving vehicle accident for sure. Could it happen because of uh, uh, domestic violence, you know, uh, choking someone, punching someone? Uh, could it happen because somebody just ran so fast and didn't notice that there is a glass door there and they hit it? Um, we've seen it. We've seen it all. Could it happen because of an explosion? Um, you heard about the explosion here in uh Fort Natchez, the TPC explosion that occurred um, November of last year. And we've had many traumatic brain injuries happening where simply just, you know, uh, the explosion uh, impact uh, um, uh, resulted in someone hitting a wall, a door, flying in the air, hitting the ground. So all of those, um, you know, uh, can result in concussion and uh, traumatic brain injury. So, uh, so the traumatic brain injury, it results in a primary injury, okay? A primary injury. And when we look at the primary injury, you have two types of primary injury. You have a focal one, meaning I can see it, I can locate it. It's happening, let's say, right in the front of your brain, which is the frontal lobe, mm -hmm. or it could be happening at the back of your brain, the occipital lobe, whatever the location is, right? Or it could be diffuse, axonal. Axonal meaning the axon, you know, of the of the brain has sheared. Okay, it's cut off, it's diffused, it's been strained, the strain, whatever happened. So that primary injury that has just happened, it can be either this or could that. Both of them at any time will have secondary, you know, uh, complications. The end product of all is when you see cognitive dysfunctions. So one, two, three. Now, the confusion that happens sometimes is that people go, well, uh, is it a concussion or is it mild TBI or is it this or is it that? Well, for the sake of the um, you know simplicity here, let's say that they are the same. A concussion is an actual uh, injury, but how severe is it is what we try to measure. And did it result in any damage? And uh, what had taken uh, a place? And why are we seeing cognitive dysfunctions that also results in psychological 
dysfunctions that we see. So those are the packages that usually comes with uh, a traumatic brain injury. Okay, so you did give a lot of information, great information. I do have some questions following up that. Now, mm -hmm. you said the prime in, primary injury can be, you know, you gave a, uh, an example of, you know, running into a glass door and I, little kids do that at the same time, right? right. I've seen a right. lot of kids and you're like, oh my gosh. So how young, because <laughs> I have that visual of a little kid running into the door, how young does the traumatic brain injury um, can be recognized? Well, uh, as young as uh, you want it to be. So if they, for example, I've taken cases, like I said, forensic, I had taken cases in the past of, uh, you know, um, uh, of uh, child abuse, where there was happening uh, an acceleration or what we call rotational acceleration, the acceleration um, uh, injuries. So, so think about it this way. If, if, if we bring in a gorilla, right? It's one of my favorite animals because it's so strong. So uh, one of my past lives, I used to be a competitive uh, weightlifter, bodybuilder. And, uh, you know, we used to look at, oh, look at Arnold, look at this guy, look at that guy. Now I look at uh, 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 gorillas and chimpanzees. They're uh, masters of muscles, right? Uh, amazing muscles. But let's assume that a gorilla that is about eight to 16 times the strength of, of men. So if you bring in eight to 16 men, and that's the strength in one uh, cre uh, creation, which is the gorilla. And that gorilla grabs someone's head and does this, you know, shakes it, right? Now, from the outside, there are no damages. Maybe you can put it through the MRI or the CAT scan and you're not going to see anything. Well, what happened? It happened, the actual you know, strain and diffuse axonal, you know, injuries, meaning the injuries from the inside where the brain cells just broke. Mm -hmm. And as they break, what happens? All the electrochemical signals are what is a mess now. Your neurotransmitters in the brain, the juices of the brain is a mess. There's something happening. So you see someone's personalities changing. And that's what happens when you talk about children. If they hit a door or if you go, you know, the baby shaking syndrome, you know, we see that. You said that's how young. And we've seen that. And actually, in uh, years ago, in one of the cases where the guy was about 6'3", a big guy, and he was just upset because the baby was crying a lot and he just shook him. And he created brain damage uh, to the child. And, and that was my example to him. I said, well, what if a gorilla shakes your head? What do you think is going to happen? He's going to have a liquid there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's going to liquidify the brain cells. Yeah. So does that make sense? I'm trying to make it, uh, yeah. you know, simple. So that we're not using too many medical terminologies here to lose the audience. No, for sure. It makes sense. So now you did uncover that um, the traumatic brain injury could be at a young age, whenever that trauma is, right. um, you know, discovered. Now, if they had it as a baby or even let's just say high school football, let's just say college NFL football, right. are they more prone to getting probably more injuries or a different injury at a later time? Oh, for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and we're going to get into, I think into the, uh, 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 what I want to get into actually is that what are the, um, uh, uh, the long-term effects, what are the short-term effects, um, and, and what happens. So let's go back to the uh, example that I uh, uh, talked to you about a minute ago, where we said, okay, somebody was in a car, um, let's take a car, a moving vehicle accident, MVA, you know, as an example, you, you had a, um, a car accident, and you start feeling pain in your neck, bilateral pain, you know, shoulders and all of that. And it starts getting worse and worse and worse, right? Okay, so the symptoms is happening within the first seven to 10, you know, days. Okay. So you starts having them. A lot of people go like, oh, no, I'm okay. And we hear it all the time. No, I didn't want to go to the emergency room. I didn't want to wait there. I was walking fine. I felt a little dizzy and I'm okay. A little shock, but I'm, I'm feeling fine. We hear that all the time, by the way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then a week later, they go like, oh, my God, I can't even barely move. What happened, right? And so what happens is that after those seven to ten days, 
that occurring symptoms lasted a year, over three months, because sometimes you say it lasts about 90 days, but they're lasting a lot longer. And the symptoms are not getting better, but they are getting worse. So um, the person, when they did the um, CAT scan, for example, because that's, you know, most likely what they go under, you know, when they go to the uh, ER room, and it showed that there is nothing, but the symptoms are lasting longer and longer and longer. Okay, so, uh, and then we start seeing what we call comorbid psychiatric uh, 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 symptoms, such as, um, uh, you know, uh, anger, agitation, um, and I'm not talking about the somatic ones, the physical ones, like the headaches that we see, depression, uh, manic uh, episodes, uh, suicidal ideation, all of that just starts happening. And, um, you know, and uh, uh, you start having what we call a limitation of functions. And, um, and usually loved ones, your partner or somebody go like, you know, it's not the same person. You know, I don't know what happened to this guy. You know, so we look at all of this and that's where we look at uh, what I told you, the psychological and the narrow part of it. So neuropsych, we look at both to go, okay, why is it lasting beyond the three months or beyond 10 days? What is happening now? What makes um, uh, the mud worse because you're adding water you know, to the mud, keep adding. What if they had other accidents in the past? Like you said, that when they were a kid, they fell off a horse, right? Yeah. And things got better, but really they were never treated. And then they played, uh, let's say they played um, football and they had a couple concussions. Well, now they had, you know, another uh, water to add to the mud, which is another moving vehicle accident. Are we talking about CTE? You know, are we talking about, uh, you know, the chronic traumatic uh, encephalopathy? You know, uh, if that is the case, uh, the case, then we are looking at the symptoms. What are we seeing? Are we seeing more headaches? Are we seeing uh, increased short-term memory, memory loss uh, and increased uh, impulsivity, uh, inattention? Uh, are the headaches becoming more severe? Uh, are we seeing any aggression? Are we seeing any uh, suicidal attempts, paranoia, uh, manic episodes? So that tells us if if that was not treated, what happened? And that's what you're asking. If, if, yeah. I'm, if I got yeah, to I love that you're uncovering the symptoms. I know that's important. If we have any viewers right now that are loved ones watching um, mm -hmm. or that have been in a car accident, how could you recognize, you know, those symptoms to where you need to get some help? And you mentioned a few, like the headache. I don't know if the light, sound, does all that, um, is that some part of the symptoms as well? Yes, ma'am. Uh, when we look at it, 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 just to make it easier for the uh, for the audience. Mm -hmm. So, because there's so much information, right? right. And it only took us three year, 30 years to get here <laughs> and learn this <laughs> and stuff. We're and we're still learning. An hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I just turned 30, uh, 32, right? But anyway. Um, <laughs> Yeah, mainly you are going to notice physical symptoms, complaints. Okay. And sometimes, and I see it a lot specifically in men, um, I don't know what you call it, our pride, our uh, ego, whatever. We try to kind of cover it up, right? Right. A little bit. And I, I see that a lot, by the way. Uh, so physical symptoms, pay attention to that. Um, the audience should pay attention to cognitive sy symptoms, alterations, um, the speed of, of recalling something, the speed of, of, of um, getting something done. And you get to see like, you know, what's happening? He's not like he used to be, or she's not like she used to be. Uh, emotional, uh, insomnia, they're not sleeping enough. And then, um, you know, um, so we pay attention to headaches, we pay attention to dizziness, we pay attention to short-term memory specifically, noise sensitivity, uh, tinnitus or tinnitus, whatever you want to call it, depending on where you're coming from, or light sensitivity, uh, migraine headaches, 
uh, are rehabbing uh, what we call some type of procedure, okay? Uh, are the psychiatric um, symptoms are becoming more um, um, observed now than it used to be? The, the thing that I hear all the time from loved ones is not, or she is not the person that I used to know. And when we say moving vehicle, accident, we're not talking about, about cars, cars, trucks, uh, motorcycles, a lot of motorcycle accidents. Um, and those are usually the worst. Um, uh, one of the ones that I, you know, was, you know, it's, it, it was stuck in my mind. <laughs> uh, um, he, uh, th the guy wanted his wife to come with him on the motorcycle. And she said, I do not want to get on the motorcycle with you. You go alone. He said, no, please, please, just this time. So they go on a motorcycle. And then he is, uh, I don't know, he gets distracted by something and he has this big pole, oh. right? And uh, he had lobotomy where they had to take part of his brain uh, out. It, it was a bad accident. And, um, you know, we, we worked with them for a number of years. We had neurotherapy. We, um, you know, we diagnosed some of all the issues. But one of the things stuck in my mind, she said, he was a jerk. He was the biggest jerk he could ever meet. Now he is the sweetest man. <laughs> and now I can't get enough of him. And he goes, I was a jerk. He looks at her. And she <laughs> said, yeah, you were a big jerk. So do we see that, uh, Dr. Jippel and Mr. Hyde sometimes? Oh, yeah, we see that personality changes. Not to that extreme, of course. Right, right. But we do get uh, different, uh, you know, um, uh, feedback. Uh, regarding what happens. So you have, again, one more time so we don't lose the audience, the physical, the emotional, psychological, the cognitive part, um, um, the insomnia, the headaches, the short-term problems, the life sensitivity, sound sensitivity, all of that. That's awesome that you uncovered that. Now I have one more question and then we're going to go to our live comments. We do have a few comments that we want to definitely um, bring to your attention. Um, but I want you to tell us about the process to recognize that there is a traumatic brain injury and or the treatment. I know that's also another lengthy process as well to recognize that there is an injury here. Right. Um, when you notice that they are let me go back to this. So, so let's say that the accident happened, whatever it is, you hit a door on a motorcycle, you got hit by a car, whatever the accident was. Then you have, you start noticing no changes the first few days. And then after the seventh or 10th day, we start noticing changes. And this is what makes mild TBI very difficult to diagnose, by the way, or disregarded or underestimated hmm. by, sadly enough, even professionals, medical professionals, but they're not experts in the area, right? So what we hear, oh, it will go away, but it's not going away. Mm -hmm. Most of those damages, probably they're permanent, but we try to mitigate, mm -hmm. diminished, or help, or maintain, or maybe unable to do anything. Mm -hmm. Right. So the loved ones in the family are noticing that there are, you know, those complaints or no complaints, but they're observing mm -hmm. that the person, for example, you know what? He lost his wallet six times this past month. He made really crazy or stupid purchases. Why did he do that? What happened? Um, in one of the cases, there was a very wealthy man that went and bought millions of dollars worth of obsolete uh, uh, equipment for his business. And after a, uh, an accident that he went through. So we're talking about impulsiveness. We're talking about attention issues. We're talking about reasoning and abstract reasoning. So we're talking about all of this. So the family have noticed that the minute that you see that, mm -hmm. right, then you need to bring it up to a, a professional to say, mm -hmm. I need a test. So the question here, what test? What do you do? Right. Again, the disregard and underestimation happens 
when, uh, of course, as you know, when when uh, when an accident happens, the first thing they do, the ambulance comes in, and when the ambulance comes in and they say, okay, uh, the paramedics they go ahead and do the GCS, which is the Glasgow Coma Scale, and they go, oh, uh, you know, his score is about fourteen, and uh, thirteen to fifteen is considered to be very mild or you know insignificant. And therefore, the CAT scan showed nothing, then the person has nothing, right? That's exactly how it goes. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, we have disregarded a mild, uh, a mild TBI, for example. But we're seeing all the other. So when that happens, do not just depend on those results as a family member. Take them somewhere where they can have a comprehensive neuropsych evaluation. This is so important, I cannot emphasize it enough because what is going to happen is that the disregard of this issue is going to create a multitude and multi uh, different areas of, of, uh, of, uh, of problems to the patient mm -hmm. and to the family. And if they can remember what I'm going to say here, and that is, the absence of evidence is not always evidence of absence. Mm. Meaning, just because the CAT scan and the GCS showed that there was nothing done or happened or occurred to this patient, that does not mean that it does not exist. For example, as I said, most of the patients, they go through what? A CAT scan, not an MRI, mm -hmm. and not even a strong MRI, right? More powerful MRI. So let alone an MRI, but we know that MRIs can reveal evidence of acute pathology in over 30% of cases that showed no problems, no abnormalities when a CAT scan was used. So that's why I keep saying absence of evidence is not always you know, evidence of absence, meaning just because you don't see it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So I know you mentioned... Um... CAT scan, MRIs, those that can probably miss it. You did speak about family members are kind of a, a crucial piece to this because they kind of can see um, the symptoms or maybe someone's trying to just be very strong, like I'm fine, or maybe they don't even notice it. Now, is there right. your comprehensive, that testing, um, does that actually hook them up to a machine? Is there, um, are you testing different parts of like maybe their motor skills? Is it a certain type of testing or it just really depends on where they're at? Well, neuropsychologists or neuropsych assessments and all of that, it is simply, it, it, uh, uh, it's face-to-face -face testing. So they have like IQ test, uh, executive functioning test. Uh, what we test in, in all of this is a number of, of areas. So the areas, just to be precise, so I can go over it with you. Mm -hmm. We go over attention of the patient, we go over uh, impulsiveness, inhibitory, planning, self-monitoring, initiation, emotional uh, regulation, working memory, you know, short-term memory, long-term memory. When we talk about memory, we're testing even different kinds of memories. We're testing semantic, declarative, we're, we're testing procedural memory. Wow. It's uh, organization skill, flexibility skills, psychological, we are getting into the area of memory, calculation, uh, visual and spatial analysis. We're getting into problem solving. We're getting into judgment. We're getting into executive functioning. And we do that through computer testing. We do it through face-to-face -face testing. We do it through uh, checklists. We do it through screeners. And uh, the skill here is what to do, how to do it in order to reach the highest the most accurate reliability and validity. And let me emphasize this. Okay. If you come in, you know, to your husband or your loved one and go like, hey, I've lost 10 pounds. I've been on this diet. And if he is <laughs> an aerocyte doc, he's going to say, oh, awesome, great. All right, I just brought you five scales. Now, if the five scale shows that you've lost 10 pounds, you really did lose five pounds. So validity is there because you weighed yourself and it shows 10, right? It's right in front of us. Mm -hmm. But is it reliable results? Doesn't really show that you have lost the 10 pounds on all five scales. 
So in all of those testing, we also shoot for validity and reliability. This is the big, you know, V and R that we work for. So we do clinical uh, interviews, we do observations. It's a lot of work. And of course, the tests do not diagnose. We are. But, you know, the clinical experience and all of that plays in uh, a big role. So once you do that, then you go like, okay, more likely than not that this occurred because of that accident. Right. Now and we look at the... I'm, I'm sorry, 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 doctor, but on average, I know you're talking about a lot of testing. It's you're diving re really deep, and I love this information. But on average, how long does this testing take? On average, uh, we have different tiers of testing. So it depends on the accident. It depends on what happened. It depends on subjective uh, complaints and reporting of the patient as we decide, should we go for this level, this level, this level, or that level? So they are different levels according to the professional that is doing um, uh, the work. On average, it takes, if it's an actual comprehensive testing, and um, anywhere from four to eight to 12 hours of testing alone. Then it takes another, it's labor intensive. Neuropsych is labor intensive. Mm. And then it takes another probably four or five, it, it depends, you know, how fast you are of scoring those tests. Then it takes another four hours of interpreting results and trying to make sense out of it. Um, if anybody can do it in, uh, in an hour, I don't know how they do it, but they have a crystal ball, but uh, we don't. But on average, it takes us anywhere from six to 20 to 25 hours to finish one comprehensive uh, evaluation. So it, it, it all depends on what is the goal and what is what we found in the first clinical interview, which is the initial psychiatric evaluation that we do it with the patient and collecting the information. Because remember, we have to look at all the collateral information as well. We also look at everything that happened or occurred before, what we call pre-morbid functioning. Right. What happened? Have they had any other cases? So if they were depressed, you know, and it was mild, are we at major depression right now? If they have very mild mood problems, are we now at the manic stage and so on? Well, wow. I'm going to tell you, doctor, you are truly gifted because if you guys tuned in at the beginning of the story, he said he went to this class for just for fun. And look at where you're at now. And I'm pretty sure <laughs> look what happened to me. <laughs> it sounds like it's still fun for you. I can hear the passion in your voice and um, mm -hmm. all the knowledge that you have. Now, I do want to get to some of these comments. We do have a lot. So get ready, Dr. Hamza. So I have Chriselle saying, does a patient get referred to you after injury has occurred? Or are patients able to just come see you if they feel something isn't right after an accident? What is the process? Uh, we see both. So we see uh, uh, patients and we, we, we uh, divide them into two categories because sometimes, um, um, you know, um, let's say an insurance company or an attorney, whoever, you know, sends us and say, this person had, uh, you know, an accident. Could you please evaluate them? Uh, sometimes the doctors refer and they say, we have the following accident uh, occurred to this person. Can you please evaluate? Sometimes a patient is very worried about himself or herself. So I've had, for example, uh, a number of doctors, uh, physicians. Um, I've had attorneys, professionals that come to me and go like, I am so worried about my skills. Can you test? Can you tell me where I'm at with all of this? We are able to locate where the damage is, which part of the brain, which air, what areas of the brain will be impacted, and uh, we're able to detect the severity of the damage. And that is very useful information in treatment and also for the patient to know what to expect. That's, that's awesome. And for Chriselle, where exactly are you located or do you have more than one office? And with COVID, are you doing virtual? We, we do all three. We do virtual, telepsych, and that is usually if they couldn't uh, get to us. Like I said, we've had cases coming to us from, um, you know, uh, East Coast, West Coast, you name it. And we do telepsych, uh, um, uh, uh, 
interviews and we get to know what what is happening or what needs to be done at least we can you know consult uh whoever the patient or their doctors or their attorneys on what needs to be done um but we have one in port natures which is right by beaumont uh an hour and a half from uh, east of houston we do have a uh, location also in uh in houston um, and, uh, and we have, uh, and we do it, uh, telepsych and we're thinking of opening a third location right now because, uh, and, and if I may say something about the third location, mm-hmm. um, we have realized and, uh, uh, myself, a neurosurgeon and, um, uh, an neurologist and both of them very, uh, well reputable and renowned in the field that a lot of times there isn't one place that you can go to and really get the actual real accurate results. So we, uh, uh, a brain institute is in the making right now. I can't give more information on that, but my expectations with the next six months, we will have that brain institute established. That's awesome. I know for those of you guys that are watching, if you guys want to also, um, we take donations for brain institutes, the research process for people like Dr. Hamza to do what they do and help those that are in need of help. So if you guys want um, a little bit more of that information, the donation is on the screen. We will also put on the comment section and on the screen uh, more information of Dr. Hamza and how to get a hold of him, uh, locations, phone number, virtual, all that good stuff, because there is a need. You are right, Dr. Hamza. I do have another comment. This one's Kim. Kim is saying this is triumph information. You help us understand what the challenges and risks are. The absence of evidence is not evidence. Wow. Profound. So great. Great comment right there. Now, I know we're kind of in the middle of the show, Dr. Hamza, but I definitely want to uncover and talk about the two Big ones. There's other ones. Of course, I don't want to shy away from that, but PTSD and CTE. Okay. I want to really explain what these are, what it stands for, how serious this is, all of that good stuff. So let's get started with the PS, PTSD, excuse me. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, PTSD and uh, well, Let's talk about uh, uh, PTS, post-traumatic stress, you know, which is, um, you know, uh, that's the first step before PTS. Um, I think I have seen thousands and thousands of patients all over the world because of that, because I was, uh, until February, I resigned after seven years of uh, uh, chairing um, the mental health uh, um, uh, committee for SAMS, the Syrian American Medical Society, which is probably, if not the largest, one of the largest medical humanitarian uh, organizations in the world. So we got we got to see, um, um, you know, um, uh, victims of war, victims of genocides, and all of that. So we've seen the real PTSD in front of our eyes. Um, and it was tough. It was a very tough process. But when we talk about, um, you know, uh, PTSD or PTS, so when you see PTSD and you say, well, what is it? Is it the flashbacks? Is it the nightmares? Is it the, uh, you know, uh, avoidance of people's, uh, the sense of threat all the time that you're feeling? Uh, what is the cause of it? The cause of it could be many things, um, you know, being, uh, you know, somewhere where you witness crimes, where you witness killing, um, um, in wars where you're witnessing, uh, you know, uh, war against humanity uh, every hour, every day, bombardments, um, uh, body parts all over. So, um, you know, so it's, it's different from one place to another. It's different from one culture to another. It's different from one person to the uh uh, to the other. What people do not talk about, and they have not, ex- uh, even DSM-5, which is, um, you know, the Bible of psychiatry and psychological disorders and all of that, seldom talks about it, is complex PTSD, where you are re-experiencing those for a longer period of time. It is more intense uh, experiences 
and you have that sense of the threat, uh, sense of the humiliation, um, uh, uh, emotional dysregulations, where you, you're, you're not um, really aware of how to regulate your emotions, uh, the hurt feeling, the worthlessness, the depression, the, uh, and the entire thing, you know, the whole thing. So that's when we talk about um, uh, PTSD and so on. And what makes it worse is when you have comorbid, comorbid meaning that something is interacting with something else. So a lot of times we have comorbidity uh, that occurs. So you have PTSD, you have PTS, uh, you have uh, complex PTSD, you have borderline personality disorder, you have borderline personality disorder and PTSD, and they all intersect with each other that sometimes misdiagnosis is the norm. Mm. So the person that is not really uh, highly skilled in the area um, uh, misdiagnose one thing for another. So uh, that's about PTSD that you wanted um, to know. Yeah, and so let's, let's ask this question. Does the traumatic brain injury, could there be a long-term effect that causes the PTSD or not necessarily? Yes, yes. Uh, for example, patients with a traumatic brain injury have 5.8, according to research and all that, increased risk for development of PTSD. Wow. That is very, uh, you know, very high. And it also impacts how long it does, does it last and how severe and so on, and what is the healing process is going to be like. So TBI, yes, it does, definitely. Okay, so we're going to go back to the PTSD. Now, CTE is another one. I want you to kind of explain a little bit more of that, the meaning, um, and how, what are the effects of this? Well, the CTE is that what we're talking about here, and, and now we're Usually, it's more known among athletes, you know, and um, usually it has four stages that we go, you know, and the stages just keeps increasing in complexity. So first, we started with, you had the first concussion, let's assume, okay, you're playing a game and you had the first concussion and it was okay, you know, you, you got into playing the game after half an hour or so, whatever, you're back, you start feeling a little depressed, some headache, maybe, maybe, you're not sure, some memory loss or some memory confusion or something, right? Mm -hmm. Then you get hit again the same month. And now you have impulses. So somebody sells you something, you just take something and throw it at them. So the first thought, you know what? I'm tired of you, right? So again, funny, uh, in a funny way, uh, my wife says something and I was like, all right, you know, the first thing I want to say, come on, shut up. You know, I'm tired of this, right? <laughs> but I'm not going to say it. I'm going like, honey, you know, come on. I said this filter, before. Filter. This no, th this is a real human thinking, right? Yeah. We do not act upon our thoughts, right? Because, yeah. you know, somebody gives you the finger while you drive. I'm a slow driver, so I get a lot of fingers sometimes, you know. And the first thing, go like, you know, why are you doing that, right? I'm right. driving the speed limit. But sometimes the first thought is, you know what? I want to take this balloon with water and throw it at you, right? And you don't do that. Those are impulses. So now we're seeing more impulses. Now we're seeing like, you know, life is really not worth it. I think about death sometimes. Then the headaches become severe headaches. So we moved into stage two. Then we go into apathy. Apathy is like, I don't care. Whatever it is, it is, right? Now the memory loss is really, really noticeable by your loved ones and so on. Your judgment is impaired. Why would you go and spend 500 bucks on socks alone? Why did you do that? Well, your judgment is just not there. Or you can get into paranoia and suspiciousness. Oh, yeah, my wife, she wants my checkbook because she's going to write that check to her uh, uh, mystery lover, right? Uh, something is going on and I am aggressive. Instead of grabbing a bag of pecans, and this happened by the way, only yesterday with one of my patients. And she said, he grabbed it, he almost broke my hand. He's, he, he's an elder gentleman. 
um, a 6'5 uh, ex-football player, just a uh, powerhouse. And he got upset over a cause. So, uh, and then um, I want to kill myself. I'm planning on how to kill myself. So we go through different stages. And the reason being, again, we started with the TBI. We started with the simple concussion. It kept progressing in the brain. And guess what? It wasn't taken care of. Is that enough? Wow. Yeah, for sure. Now, both of those, doctor, we talked PTSD, CTE. That sounds very different. They are caused by the traumatic brain injury. Now, the question of the day is, is there a cure? Can the family do anything? Could there be any type of treatment to help these two PTSD and CT? And you might have to you know, answer it separate because they're kind of a standalone, right? Right. When you're dealing with anything that has to do with, um, with a traumatic brain injury, we are going to have last effects and impact and residual uh, symptoms and so on, no matter what we do. Is there a cure, you can take a pill, you can do something and everything is gonna be okay? No, it's not. And I hope there isn't anyone out there that says, yeah, it can be. You are dealing with very delicate, very delicate, magnificent machine called the brain. Mm -hmm. And the problem is once you lose it, you lose it. It's not like neurogenesis, you know, it's going to happen and take effect. And even if it does, which I'm not going to get to the neuroscience of it right now, it's not going to be in the impact area that says, okay, I lost it. Now the brain cells are coming back and rejuvenating. That's why I keep telling the young people all the time, please, before you take that lethal substance, let it be alcohol, let it be uh, meth, let it be heroin, let it be whatever it is, realize the brain cells, once they're gone, they're not gonna come back. So a TBI is no different. Now, what can we do? What we can do is that we can make things a little bit better for the patient. Mm -hmm. We can do is that we can maintain so the decline is not steep and we are managing what has taken place. So it's a very difficult question to answer because at what level are we talking about? What are we seeing? What symptoms? Is it more of the cognitive than the physical? Is it more of the psychological than the cognitive or the physical? And this depends on what treatment you'll have. Remember, it's a treatment, but it's not a cure. Okay, that's that's very important information because at the end of the tunnel, that that could be something that you know clients or loved ones could experience, all stemming from a traumatic brain injury that could have started at a young age, could have been trauma, running into the door, stuff like that. Um, and you said something very important: the the brain is so magnificent and powerful. So I think we need to be careful if there's any parents out there and just being mindful of this, even sports, it's not just football. I know everyone already right now is thinking football, but you can even get it from basketball, from boxing, from soccer, hockey, all of those good stuff. So i um, just being right. very careful. Um, the last thing I know we're kind of coming close to the end of the show, doctor, um, but I just can't wrap it up without getting into this one. Depression. Okay, I want you to kind of um, go over whether it's the traumatic brain injury, the levels that you uncovered earlier in the show, whether it's PTSD, whether it's CTE, all of these have a stemming root that can have some depression. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? For sure, for sure. This is a very important um, subject. Um, Usually, it's very interesting that sometimes you get asked the question, if it's in the court, the physician, or by another uh, doctor or someone that say, oh, yeah, they're only depressed. Well, depression is the most common psychiatric complication of TBI. Mm -hmm. So that says it all. Yeah. It's the most common by research and findings complication, psychiatric complication of TBI. So it complicates things. So for example, patients with TBI 
remain at elevated risk of depression for decades, not months, for decades post-injury. Yeah. And 90% of patients with TBI and major depressive disorders, so if they have you know, MDD or major depressive disorder, experience the onset of depression post-TBI. You're talking about a huge number here that we must pay attention to, but also depression leads to suicidal ideation or actual su suicide. So among patients with TBI, they are higher than in the general population. So if you've had a TBI, more likely you are going to think of suicide or attempt suicide than the average person. And patients with TBI and loss of consciousness have four times greater the likelihood of attempting suicide than the general population. So I just wanna give this data to kind of give you a little, you know, to the audience, a little wake up call about this. Right. Of course, depression also could be associated with uh, the risk of bipolar disorder, which is 5.3 folds more with TBI patients than the average. So we're talking about everything. So we talked about the PTSD, we talked about depression, we talked about manic, we talked about bipolar. So it's not only depression, but in depression, you know, well, what does it mean to me when we talk about depression? Well, I have somebody in my family, let's say you have a son that is doing boxing, right? Or playing some sport and he keeps even, you know, going on a scooter and he keeps falling one time after the other and he or she is not wearing a helmet, which is a must, folks, a must to minimize the damage, okay? And we start noticing that the child is, uh, you know, uh, his, his interest in things is a little bit less. The activities is less. There's either, you know, some weight loss, weight gain. Uh, the appetite either increases or decreases. Uh, there is what we call psychomotor agitation, meaning like doing things, you know, uh, uh, physically is happening. Or things that they used to be good at and now they're not is it, gonna, uh, they call it psychomotor retardation, uh, fatigue, loss of energy, uh, feeling, um, you know, inadequate or inappropriate guilt, and so on. I call it the, uh, the triad. So you are negative about yourself, you're negative about what's going on, you're negative about the future or the past. So you're negative about things and so on. There is depression. We all identify depression and say, this person is sad or this person is depressed. Well, we just said that it is the most common complication, psychiatric complication with TBI. That along with the somatic physical, which is the headaches usually or dizziness and so on. So uh, we need to pay attention to that because if it's not taken care of, specifically in CTE, you're talking suicide could be next. Wow, this is, it's a definitely, like you mentioned earlier, it's a serious topic. Um, loved ones, family members, friends, um, being mindful of these things so that you could pay attention because you could save someone's life right. at the end of the day. Um, I'm going to end it with one question in a second, doctor. But before that, I want to tell everyone that's watching the powerhouse that we have on the show today. You've been featured in articles at the national and international level, um, talking about PTSD, HDS, focusing on mental health, depression, all of that good stuff. And so I want to commend you for everything that you've already done in our community. And I think we would want you on another show to keep going on some of these things because you're right. An hour is not enough at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you for your generosity, for inviting me. and Thank you so very much. And whatever I'm able to share with, you know, with anyone or with all to minimize, um, you know, accidents, to minimize uh, the underestimate of uh, TBIs, which is truly underestimated um, in the community, <clears throat> you know. I'm, I'm, I'm here to help. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of information that was given in today's show, um, a lot of great pointers that we can recognize as any individual that could 
help someone else out there, whether they've been in an accident or it's just a simple running into the wall. So I want to leave you with this, doctor. If you had to leave our guests with one last thing, a quote um, or anything that you could let them know, um, what would you tell our viewers that are watching right now? Hmm. What would I tell them? <laughs> This is a very good one. I honestly, the, the, the one that I, uh, I like, like your, uh, uh, your audience said, in life in general, absence of evidence is not always evidence of absence mm -hmm. in anything we do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and when people report and complain issues, let it be depression. And, and depression is a big one uh, because we lose a lot of people you know, um, to depression where we underestimate uh, this monster, you know, mm -hmm. and um, the sad thing is when it leads to suicide, that we really, uh, uh, we need to take it to someone that can do the work and someone that can do the risk assessment, um, you know, for whatever we see or observe. Uh, trust your gut feeling mm -hmm. when you see something. And don't just uh, act based on um, a professional that just tells you, no, it doesn't matter, or it's not important, or minimize the risk. Trust your gut feeling. That's it. Yeah, that's awesome advice, Dr. Hamza. I want to thank you for being on the show today and tuning in on with our viewers today. Um, just like Dr. Hamza said, traumatic brain injury is something serious for you guys. Not just that injury, but what it could lead, what it could cause, all that good stuff. And like he just mentioned, depression. Um, be mindful of those things. Be mindful of those um, behavior so that you can also help someone and potentially save someone's life. He just said, go with your gut and get that proper help for that individual. I want to thank you guys for tuning in to Talk To Me Tuesday on a Tuesday. I want to thank you guys for sharing the show. The more you share, the more knowledge we could spread in this world. I want to thank you again for tuning in on a Tuesday with your host, Mighty Beat.